Earplay is made possible by grants from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the National Endowment for the Arts. A play for radio. The Midnight Mocker by Leo Goldman. Midnight. The time when most people switch off radios and television sets and prepare for sleep. But midnight is also the time when the darkly flavored disc jockeys take to the airwaves, ready to cater to you should sleep elude you, ready to join you in insomnia, to help you while away the night, talking away darkly through the night, until replaced by the tinny brightness of the morning announcers, ready to cajole you with thoughts that the world is really all sugar and spice. And there are enough listeners listening to keep both in business. Radio playwright Leo Goldman uses this setting to comment on you and on me in his play, The Midnight Mocker. Bong, 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 bong. Oh, forget it. You know it's midnight. Uh. <clears throat> Now, millions of you are demanding to know who I am. What do I look like? All right, I'll tell you. I have bad teeth. Sign of a decayed actor. When I was young and uh, <laughs> ambitious, I brushed my teeth after every meal in order to brush away cavities. Instead, I brushed away my teeth. Now, as soon as I tell you the name of this dentifrice, you'll rush out by the millions to buy it. Why are you so perverse? Ready? The name is Special Grit. But one word, whatever you do tomorrow with your Special Grit, whether you employ it as a pumice to sand your old wood floor or to polish up the rear bumper of your old car, don't bring it even approximately within spitting range of your remaining teeth. Oh, oh. what else am I selling tonight? Oh, yes, the usual k rap. Tomorrow morning, you run out to buy a fresh load of K-Rap. Tell them I sent you. Oh. I guess that's all for tonight. Go to sleep early for a change so you can wake up for that morning show with Miss X America and her own special brand of K-Rap. As for me, I'm taking a fast fade into the sand. Good morning. This is Marjorie Friend, your friend of the morning, bringing messages and greetings and morning cheer to all you shut-ins and vets and good people out there. Our morning songster is, of course, the robin, my very favorite bird. Oh, yes, when I was little, I used to think, how can Mr. Robin eat that breakfast food and then go hopping and singing all over the front lawn? Hopping, yes, but singing? <laughs> well... I thought if some of God's creatures have to eat worms and can sing about it, I guess I have nothing to complain about, especially when I can enjoy my favorite breakfast food, special crunchies. And you know, I still do enjoy them after all these years. <laughs> oh, oh, here, I didn't mean to do a commercial there. It just popped right out because, you know, I really believe in the products that I tell you about. I really do. Now... Early this morning, I received many telephone calls from you good people. You were badly upset because you love me just as I love you. And you feel I must respond to a certain unprovoked midnight attack upon my honesty and sincerity. Now, as you all know, I'm a morning person, so I myself did not hear the attack. But, of course, I've heard about this midnight monster, as he is called, and the really morbid fascination that he seems to have for a certain kind of night person. 
Now, I don't pretend to understand why this kind of midnight morbidity is sweeping the country. I think it must be a kind of fever or sickness, uh, like the flu, and after a few weeks of misery and headaches and maybe diarrhea. <laughs> oh, I think from what I hear about him that many of his listeners just might find themselves affected in that way. And after a while, our country will build up its natural immunity, and this midnight rash will all fade away. So I think that he, uh, I mean it, is uh, just a kind of really nasty flu bug. And now, about having held the title of this America for one wonderful year, 25 years ago, I shall always be grateful for the opportunity it gave me to see our beautiful country, to form many lasting friendships, and to make use of whatever small talents God has given me. And now to read some messages and to play some of your favorite songs. From Susie to all the boys at Grant Veterans Hospital, a great big valentine and lots of love, and especially to Corky and Red, and for Big Mike and Slim and Curly and Stan the Man and Rusty. It's the midnight bird. Oh, it's Diarrhea Danny. <coughs> Oh, don't you feel the midnight miasma rising up through your stereo speakers into both twitching nostrils? No. Then you haven't heard Our Lady of the Evening, Madam Marjorie. Or is it the morning? Yeah, she works the morning shift. Selling, selling, selling. <coughs> oh, quarantine me for the national health. <coughs> Cigarette, anyone? Um, time out for cough medicine. <sighs> oh, I'm in voice again. Deep, rich, mellow, flowing, mighty Mississippi River down to the Delta voice again. Now I can sell you down that river and up that river. Here we go. Big special on garbage. Be there when the doors open wide. Be first in line when that great garbage truck dumps on you. And then take it all home and wrap it all up in you-know-what and bury it under your apple tree. And then what? And then you can sit down to a well-deserved breakfast of special crunchies. Well, how did I happen to think about special crunchies just then? I was talking about something else, wasn't I? Uh, garbage or uh, worms or uh, worms and garbage and... Uh, it just uh, somehow popped into my head and out of my mouth. Pop, pop, poppity pop. Out of my deep subconscious life. Out of that mysterious ocean of thought and feeling. Up from the very bowels of my being. Scarcely aware was I of what true heart was uttering. Quench, 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 go your brains. Quack goes your mind as munching Marjorie goes munching, crunching forward on your heart, your face. Your trust in womankind. Oh, yeah. And she's a mother, too. Of two lovely, wholesome, simply creamy future Miss Americas. What will they think of mother now? Can't kid the kitties, Margie. They always see the worm. Just like your favorite birdie. And now I shall reveal to Madam Margie or Marjorie or Marjorie or whatever the hell the brand name is the secret of the morbid attraction which I am now exerting upon the minds and hearts of all you faithful listeners. You ready out there? Hang on to your bedsides. Take a grip on your sleeping wives. Beware of swaying chandeliers, vibrating window panes, cracking walls. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Four, three, two, one, zero. Truth. Shh. All I have to do to sell a product is to call it by its rightful name, garbage. That's right. And people fall out of bed laughing and run out to buy it. Of course, I can't sell just any kind of garbage. I mean, I couldn't sell, say, $25,000 worth, like a brand-new collapsing house. No, $2 is about the limit. Anything under 2 bucks is good for a laugh. 
What are people doing with all that K-Rap, I wonder? They must be wrapping it all up. The house, the wife, the car. I have a feeling if times are good, I might make it to three bucks. Times are bad, a buck. What, half a buck? Two bits? A dime? How much garbage can you buy for a dime? Plenty. When you get down to ten cents, it's pure. There's nothing good left in it. Did you hear that out there? Good night, America. Good morning. I'm Marjorie Friend, your morning friend, bringing a little morning music to all of you good people who really know the meaning of long, dark nights. Well, you'll never guess who that bird is. That, dear friends, is a little mockingbird imitating a big, bad crow. It's a very clever bird, oh yes. We had lots of mockingbirds in my hometown, some of them walking around in long pants. Because you know it is so easy to mock and to jeer. Now, I'm receiving so many telegrams and telephone calls and special delivery letters that my head is just going round and round. If you're sound asleep at midnight, as I always am, and a stranger steals up behind you and suddenly starts choking and beating you, can you sit up in bed and calmly ask him why he is so unhappy, so vicious? Can you argue with a midnight mugger about your own good character? No. Because you know and I know that you cannot win an argument with such a person. Such a person can never believe anything good about you because he thinks everyone on earth is just as hypocritical and nasty and brutal and evil as himself. And now that is the last comment I shall ever make on this midnight... <laughs> I almost said vulture, but I guess mockingbird or magpie or, uh, or maybe screech owl will do. Oh, dear. I feel as if I've been sitting up all night long in some cold, dark place and I want to return now to a warm, sunny room with all of you good, kind people. And now, from Harry and Betsy to Jimmy and Lucy, very best wishes on your golden wedding anniversary, and may all your loving family be around you as you celebrate this wonderful day. Ah! Ah! It's the Midnight Screecher. Turn off your screech box, or the screecher will reach you and eat you for breakfast, you delicious little special crunchy you. <laughs> oh. I bet you think there was a real screech owl, don't you? Well, you're wrong. That was your very own midnight mockingbird. I can imitate anything. I can even imitate a live human being. And that's what I'm doing right now. But I'll tell you a secret. There's nobody here. Just a voice. The voice of midnight. No, dear sleepyhead, midnight is not alive. Midnight is simply darkness, a darkness so deep, so thick, so heavy, that out of it a voice finally begins to speak. But who was I when I had a body like your own? I've told you, an actor. A good actor? No, a mock actor, a mimic, no depth, no heart, no soul. In fact, about the same as now. But I must have had something that I don't have now. Oh, yes. Illusions. The chief illusion by which I sustained myself, the great ideal of my youth, was that as I grew older, I would grow deeper. As I went deeper into life, I would go deeper into art. Unfortunately, as I grew older, I became shallower. Why? Why? Well, some people are strengthened and deepened by failure, and some people are hollowed out and have to keep on flowing booze into that hollow for the rest of their lives. Booze or something. Maybe like you, dear listener? No, you're running deeper as you age, not shallower? Good for you. I wouldn't want to think that you and I have anything in common. As for myself... 
I began going deeper and deeper into drink, into debt, into despair. Deeper. Right. Okay, enough. Now, how did I finally get behind the microphone? Through an ex-friend of an ex-friend to get me off their hands. All I had to do was stay sober long enough to read the commercials. Hell, I could do that. Some actors are superb at imitating a drunk. I'm in a class by myself at imitating a sober. So there I was, one, two o'clock in the morning, pitching used cars and corn removers and dandruff killers. And then a funny thing happened. I started making little comments on my own commercials. You know, just small observations, such as you've grown to know and cherish. And why did I do it? Well, for one thing, two of my ex-wives were collecting all my salary. I had to steal money for myself to keep myself in booze. But I didn't have the guts to walk right off the job. Besides, if they fired me, I could collect unemployment compensation and maybe steal some of that. So every night... I told a little more truth about the garbage I was peddling. Nothing. I figured the whole world was asleep, or at least the whole town. So I really stepped it up. Capital G, garbage. Come and get it, suckers, at your friendly neighborhood garbage dealers. And then came the big blast. They sent for me, the station manager, the sponsors, the agencies... I thought, they're not going to fire me. They're going to surround me in a soundproof room, turn off the lights, and hack me to death. Well, they surrounded me, all right, in a soundproof room. They closed in. I was about ready to send for a priest. And when they were very close, they whispered, How much money do you want? Never, never to leave us. See, they'd heard a terrifying rumor that a rival station was trying to hire me away. And that rumor hadn't reached me because in the secretive way of your truly accomplished boozer, I was stealing away each misty morning and hiding incognito with my bottle in the hotel room without benefit of telephone. And in the meantime, sales were doubling, tripling, quadrupling, quintupling. That's what was happening in the silence, the vast silence of the city out there. I thought you were dead. But no, you were dead laughing. You were forming fan clubs. I didn't know. I slept half the day and drank away the other half. Okay, they whispered. You want a one-year contract? No. Good. Then you want a two-year contract? No. Fine. Then what you really want is a five-year contract? No. Great. Then it's a deal. We'll make it a ten-year contract? No. No. Then what do you want? I want to talk to the rival station. What? Why? Power. Trunk power. But even more than that, the rival station has more watts power, transmission power, network power. Hey, world, I have an audience. Can you imagine? I, the living dead, has gained an audience. Of whom, I wondered. Of the living? Are you listeners among the living? And only I among the dead? Or are we all, each in his own way, deceased? You, an audience of the dead, gravely, laughingly, soundlessly, receiving nightly broadcasts from a ghost. So here I am, hoarding this microphone, Mr. Macabre, the latest popular monster, drawing even with Mighty Frankenstein in the monster popularity poll, passing up Count Dracula, that dullard, Running far ahead of all the devils, witches, zombies, vampires, goblins, ghouls, and assorted evil spirits which have lately taken possession of our hell-bound country. I'm a star. Never mind that I'm a dead star. I've made it. Now, if only I could give a damn. Ah, too late. I've gone into an irreversible decline. But never mind me. I'm not interesting even to myself. I bore myself. What is interesting is whether you too have slipped into a decline. I mean, after all, I'm your hero. You worship me. You write thousands of fan letters, all of which have burned on arrival. You'd give anything for a photograph, a lock of hair, a fingernail clipping, evidence of actual bodily existence. Why? I'm not exactly a figure like George Washington or Paul Revere or Thomas Jefferson or Daniel Boone or Abraham Lincoln. I'm a booze hound, a whiskey canal, 
I'm a garbage peddler, a midnight mugger. I attack helpless American womanhood. There she is, Miss America. A widow supporting two children, husband lost in our latest war. And I mock her efforts to bring bread home to her kiddies, selling what she has for the highest price. Well, sure, who doesn't? But remember her 25 years ago. What a sweet dream she was then. Are you still listening out there? Then I ask you, stop supporting my sponsors. Quit buying their garbage. And I know it'll happen. Tomorrow you'll clean out the shelves again. Tomorrow night I'll gain another million listeners. And now I believe I know why. Because you are the mockers. Every one of you. And in me, you finally found a voice. Now do yourself a favor. Stop mocking your life away. Stop mocking your particular American sweet dream of success and happiness and infinite love and stardom in your own little heaven. Turn off your radio and go to bed at last. No? And I'll turn it off for you. Good night. Good morning. I'm Marjorie Friend, hoping to share a morning hour with you. Now, what does a mechanical cuckoo do? Well, at midnight, it cuckoos 12 times. It doesn't fly. It only says to all the world, Cuckoo, you're crazy. Does it do any of the things that you good people do? Does it contribute thousands of dollars to help the ill... Does it send letters to shut-ins, to vets, to parents of stricken children? No, it is helpless. It is only a voice. Poor little whiskey baritone. How can a mere human voice offer a kind word to people who are really suffering? It can't. No, it can only moan and whine, pity its poor, miserable self. While all around, people are dying for one word of comfort. Oh, but such people are too small. Only little people like you and me can see them. Uh, all right, I am little, and so I do what I can for other little people, which is little enough. But less than this I cannot do. And now if he, that pathetic little drunken monster crying and whimpering into his bottle, if he would help one person, it would be more real. It would mean... More than all of his malicious humor at the expense of those who do try to help. And if I appear foolish or weak or ridiculous, I don't care. I'm not interested in those appearances. The reality of helping someone is what I care about. And that is the wonderful part of being on radio, that my voice can reach others. Ah, but I am a person, not a disembodied voice. I don't throw my voice at you like a ventriloquist at a dummy. No, I talk to each one of you. And now to all of you people who have been insisting that I really tell him off once and for all, I hope this will satisfy you. And to all of you other people who are urging me to have a kind of public debate with him, I will say this. I have no desire at all to meet this midnight maniac. No, it would be like going to a police lineup to identify the man who has attacked you. I'm not even curious. Some people tell me he's a really horrible, disgusting, bloated creature, and some people say he isn't at all. So many women have been calling me up and claiming to be his ex-wives that he couldn't have married them all. <laughs> Besides, they all give different descriptions. He probably sounds to hundreds of women just like their ex-husbands. Oh, but enough of him. Uh, to me, he no longer exists. And now to come back, thank God, to something human. From the parents of little Laura Jane, a world of thanks to all of the wonderful, understanding people who sent toys and cards and contributions. We cherish all of your letters. They were a real comfort. Coco, 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 Coco. Coco, 
Coco, coco, coco. It's midnight in Cuckoo Land. Well, well. So hundreds of my ex-wives are telephoning you, eh? What do you mean I couldn't have married them all? Of course I married them all. But I wore a different face and used a different voice for each one of them. Shrewd move, I call that. Hey, old pal. Hey, old buddy out there. Don't you wish you were an actor? Think of the thousands of women you could marry. And they'd never be the wiser. Actually, friend, to the best of my recollection, I married only three or four. Or was it five? Oh, now it comes back to me. The reason they give completely different descriptions of me is I was in completely different shape for each one of them. For wife number one, I was Mr. America. You don't believe that, do you? Well, it was a job requirement at the time, 25 years ago. I don't mean for marriage. I mean for the stage. That and a torn T-shirt. You could hardly get an audition if you went bulging through a torn T-shirt. Bulging muscle, that is, not flab. No, bulging flab through a torn T-shirt was my second marriage. You guessed it. I couldn't get a lead on stage, and I couldn't do much with it off stage either. I am not only a failed actor, I am a lousy lover. Once upon a time, naturally, I dreamed of being the world's most perfect lover. On stage, off stage, on screen, off screen, absolutely the world champion of tenderness yet firmness, and firmness yet tenderness, the tenderest, firmest, tempestuousest, tenderest, tempest. Well, you know what I mean. And routing the villain. But a funny thing happened on the way to the bedroom. I became the villain. The boozing husband, the fat clown. Not the tragic clown, not the actor playing clown for all the world to mock while his own heart is breaking. No, just an ordinary, unfunny, everyday drunken clown. Maybe a little bit like you there, old bar buddy. No? Well, good for you again. God knows the nation and the world need sweet lovers like you. Not to mention your lucky wives. I'll skip over wife number three, mercifully, and over wife number four, charitably, and over wife number five, if there was a wife number five. Does it matter? No. In the entire history of my marriages, only one thing matters now. Are you ready out there? Marjorie Friend was wife number one. Yeah. She took my virginity and my heart and my soul and left the voice you hear now. Can't hide the truth forever, Margie. Now, about hooking up with her again, by radio, that is, as all morning and midnight America are now demanding, I'll give it a try. But listen, Margie, if you're up past midnight, and I have a feeling you are, I could never make it to your early morning program. At that hour, not only do I have no body, I have no voice. So how about a date? Any midnight you're free. You at your station, I at mine. Until then, good night, hold number one. Good morning, and a very early morning, 30 seconds past midnight. This is Marjorie Friend, apologizing to all my morning friends for keeping you up so late, or getting you up so early. Are you there, Mocker? All that you've left of me, sweetheart. I don't pretend to understand that. Now, you have made what many people consider to be a very grave charge. You have made a graver charge, that I no longer exist. No, Margie, you can banish me, but you can't banish me. Oh, uh, it's very late. I'll come right to the point. Can you produce any documentation? Year, month, day, and most precious yellowing certificate of lawful marriage? No. Oh, really? Why not? Because you have it. I? Sure. I always leave it to my ex-wives and their lawyers to latch onto those documents and file them in some time capsule or time bomb set to blow my brains out later in court. In what city were we married? 
Under what name? You know, records are kept. They could easily prove your case. Too easily. Producing my name could produce too many screaming exes hunting down fresh alimony. Oh, then what you are saying, besides a great deal of nonsense, is that you have no legal evidence at all. My evidence takes a more intimate and revealing form than any mere legal evidence. Then reveal it. What are you waiting for? I can describe it. Only you can reveal it. Exhibit A. Birthmark. Left cheek. Confess. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about the mole on your left cheek. The birthmark setting off the beauty of your otherwise perfect Snow White prize winning behind. That is the most grotesque and ridiculous no, thing I No, I never have... thought it was grotesque and ridiculous. I always thought it was charming and delightful. And I'm sure any impartial jury to which you would submit Exhibit A for close inspection would have to agree with me. In the first place... Everybody, it just isn't so. Oh, then you've given it away discreetly to a plastic surgeon. In the second place... One place at a time. If it were so... You wouldn't show, right? Right. <laughs> Wrong. You let the judges check out your face, neck, arms, boobs, butt, legs, and every other bit of you they could spy out. But now you're just too desperately shy to reveal one additional eighth inch of quivering birthmark. That is too absurd and childish to dignify with any kind of comment. Whoever you are, Mocker, you are absolutely out of your mind. You're right. I'm crazy to have kept your secret all these years. We were married for one year, 26 years ago, when you up and junked me. Well, not that I blame you. I turned out not to be Mr. America, so you decided to become a virgin again and go for the title. But I didn't disqualify you, did I? When the judges said, is there any person present who can show cause why this woman should not be joined in holy matrimony as the virgin bride of all America, did I step forward to shout, uh -huh, that's no miss, that's my ex-missus. I'll grant you it was cheaper than alimony, a bargain all round, but you're safe now, Margie. No one can snatch off your crown, so fess up. Are you all through? And not quite. Body gone, liver gone, brain dissolved, but still retain voice and memory of you. I see. You conveniently blame your unfortunate first wife for your drinking and your failure. No, you know better than that. I was a half drunk when you married me and a whole drunk when you unmarried me. And now I'm about a drunk and a half. But you didn't drive me to drink. I wasn't your passenger. I did all my own driving. Now, what do you mean, failure? I'm the biggest draw in the history of nighttime radio. I send millions of people red-eyed to work every morning. Not booze. Lack of sleep. And the money I'm making. Well, if I had an ass, it would be sitting in a nest of thousand-dollar bills. And I owe it all to you, Margie, for having left me. How could I have made good without whole harems of ex-wives for comic material? Five wives are a gas. One wife is no joke. May I speak? Shoot, unless your lawyers have clapped all ten hands over your mouth. The only sense that I can make of all your gibbering is that you were married once upon a time to a Miss America contender, and in your drunken fantasy you have mistaken me for her. But Miss Americas are not interchangeable, Mr. Mocker. You said yourself your brain has dissolved in alcohol. Disappeared without a trace. I'm a voice from the other side. Good shot, Margie. Never claimed you were a fool. If you were, you wouldn't be where you are today. Now, you'd still be married to me. I'm the fool. I don't deny it. I had you, then I lost you. But I'll tell you a little secret. You do still love a secret, don't you? And you do know how to keep one, too. Every red-blooded American boy -o grows up dreaming of Miss America. And in his own drunken fantasy marries the princess. Oh? Uh, yes. How can the poor lad help it? You are squirted directly into his brain until every intoxicated little brain cell is just a dripping and a quivering with your sweet promise. All American men have Miss America for an ex-wife. All but the bachelors, I suppose. <laughs> They've stayed pure, faithful to the ideal. Oh, now I understand. You mean that I am your ex-wife symbolically. Yes, dear, and in every other way known to man. And now I'll tell you one last open secret. I still love you. You still there? Yes. I love the memory of you from a great, great distance. 
from millions and billions of miles away. It's as if I were falling farther and farther away from the sun, so far away that the sun has vanished forever. And yet, I haven't quite lost the memory of sunlight. Can't you hear my voice? You said yourself it is the voice of death. Yes, I did say something like that, didn't I? You've hit it. Imagine, dear listener, confessing your love after 25 years of silence and then hearing your love reply that your voice is the voice of death. Imagine discovering that your own voice, which in your youth you considered to be the full-throated voice of love, the very bird song of love, has become unmistakably the last guttural choking whiskey baritone of death. You think I am the last one to be surprised? You're right. It's always a shock to discover your latest transformation on the way to complete monsterhood. Are you there, Marjorie? I hear your voice. So do I. Now. But let me tell all of you, the human voice is astonishing. Even after it has become the voice of death, even after it has chosen death, it calls out to life. To the very last moment, it cries out to be delivered from the death it yearns for. Oh, yes, life is very powerful. It can barely manage to pry loose its own grip on itself. Until tomorrow, midnight. Hello? Oh, well, I... I don't want to go on talking alone at this hour. So, to all my friends, it's very late. Good night. Bong, 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 bong. Bong. It's midnight over the boneyard. Not everyone has the privilege of tolling himself all the way into his own grave. Another unexpected benefit of radio, dear invisible audience. Well, cannot one of you seated there in chapel find a good word to speak in praise of the departing? Silence. From all that listening throng, not one yea leaps forth to echo here at graveside. Last week, last month, you loved me. Tonight, you have abandoned me. And why? Because last night, oh, fateful midnight, I did declare my love. Well, monsters do love, you know. Think of the hunchback of Notre Dame. Think of Frankenstein. Think... Of yourself. But no, no longer am I the midnight mocker. Tonight I am the mocked. You were waiting for me to blast her, annihilate her, send her whimpering back to the protection of her morning friends. Instead I said, Miss Marjorie, Miss Ex America, you, voice of morning light, I, voice of midnight darkness, love your sweet memory. My reward? A national kiss-off. I turned a midnight horror story into a morning soap opera. Women laugh at me. Men yawn. The nation has fallen out of love with me. Divorce has set in. Sponsors are withdrawing at the speed of light. The end has come. You've all heard of the overnight success. I am the overday flop. Well, Midnight America, what can I sell you now that I'm a lover? The party's over. There's just one last sale I can make. If not to you, then to myself. And here we go. Big sale on bottled sleep. You can take it in tablet form, in capsule form, or in liquid form. But no matter how you take it, it has only one side effect. It kills you. If you dissolve 25 tablets in a pint of booze, as I have done, and drink it down at midnight, as I have done... About five minutes will do it. Ah, you say, another gag, another gimmick, another game, another act, another fraud, another swindle. Is nothing real, not even death? Well, you've been sold so many fictions. How can you be blamed for not being able to distinguish lies from truth? Well, think of it this way. Lies sell. Yes, but the truth, the truth could be even more sensational. It's all show business, right? 
We know that at curtain call, the dead hero jumps upright from the bloody stage, bows, waves, and trots off to the wings to count the receipts. Oh, how we do love death and profitable resurrection. The good actor dies like an acrobat. The bad actor dies awkwardly. The clown to the last. Dying with style. Oh, that's the best of acts. Give me more light. That's the way to die. That's the cry of genius, of life, of love. But some cry or whisper, give me more darkness. There is still too much light by which I may see myself. Give me deep, eternal darkness. Give me that silence, that abiding silence where I'll never again hear the sound of my own voice. Good morning. That is the victory scream of an American eagle. People tell me I'm the winner in a great national contest. People tell me that my voice is the voice of America, not his. I want to thank all of you for your comforting words, but I just don't feel like a winner. I only feel the waste of that man's life, all of that intelligence, all of that feeling, all of it lost forever in mockery and self-mockery. The voice of the eagle speaks for many of you this morning. The voice of the morning dove for me. The Midnight Mocker by Leo Goldman. Jay Meredith played Marjorie Friend. Henry Raymer was the Midnight Mocker. Produced by Earplay, the Radio Drama Production Center for Public Broadcasting. This week's Earplay Hour concludes now with a performance by the Natural Sound Workshop in New York City. Kirk Nurock, director. Performances are based on human voice and body sounds. Nurock has said... In a sense, natural sound is both primitive and futuristic. It goes back to raw, pre-verbal expression and aesthetics. But at the same time, it's looking forward to the future shock days, when we'll have more and more free time. Participation in the arts will help fill those hours. And I believe that we are all natural musicians. The piece we're to hear now also has voice soloist Jay Clayton and saxophonist Roger Rosenberg as well as piano and bass. Scat Melisma, with the Natural Sound Workshop, directed by Kirk Nurock.
Scat Melisma with the Natural Sound Workshop directed by Kirk Nurock concluding this hour of ear play. <laughs> Thank you.